Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day 19 in our 90-day SAT prep series. So today we're going to spend half an hour in the math section and then about 25 minutes in the reading section. So to get started with the math section, we're going to be working from the SAT released 2019 test booklet from the state of Maine. It also had a question and answer service that has been released. And we'll be going through problems 9 through 15 of the math no calculator section and then problems 9 through 15 of the math with calculator section. So as we go through, I'm going to give you my tips, tricks, advice, insights, and strategy uh, strategies I have for the SAT math section, which I will uh, I would I would expect you guys to be putting in your notes because I think it'd be very, very helpful to have these in your notes. And then as I go through the problems, you can put solutions and things like that in your workbook if you'd like. But anything that I say should go in your notebook, I'd highly recommend taking notes on. So as I go through, I'll give you, be sure to give you my advice on these questions and show you how to do them the fastest. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with question nine. So we're going to work with the math no calculator section first, problems nine through 15. For a ride, a taxi driver charges an initial fare of $3 plus 40 cents for every one-fifth of a mile driven. If the total charge for a ride is $27, what is the distance traveled in miles? All right, well, if we're charging 40 cents for every fifth of a mile driven, well, if we wanted to convert that to how many miles we're going to have, then we're going to need to multiply 0 0.4 by 5 and then multiply this by 5 as well. And that's going to give us that one mile, that 5 over 5 each mile, is going to cost that five times that 40 cents. So we see that that's going to give us uh, a two dollars, right? So we're going to have 27 minus three is going to give us 24. And then we have 24 has to equal our two dollars per mile. We divide each side by two, divide each side by two, and we see that our number of miles then is going to equal 12. So our answer there is going to be C. All right, so as far as tips you should put in your notes for this, Notice how as I read through the question, since I kind of realized pretty early on that it was going to be a question involving an equation, I started writing out my equation as I read through the word problem. If you have a long word problem that's four lines or longer, I recommend that as you read through and see an equation that you start writing it down on your own. Try to do it without pausing to stop though. Try to keep reading and just write it down as you read through. So try to keep your eyes on the words. That's what I would recommend doing. If you want to put that strategy in your notes, you can. I think that's usually... Uh, helps you save time, which I think is crucial for the SAT. All right, question 10. So we've got an equation up there. All right, so one thing that I'm going to check anytime I have a lot of variables, right, and not a lot of numbers, what I'm always going to check is what my, uh, well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check A through D because sometimes it'll be one variable equals something, right, and answer choice is A through D. Then I know I just have to go through and solve for that variable. So that's one strategy I use that you could put in your notes. Um, if I don't see that, which I don't in this one, then what I'm going to check is I'm going to check my last part, okay, my last sentence with this question mark. So I see according to the Torricelli's law, which the following is equivalent to the velocity v. Okay, so this means that I just need to have to go through and solve for what v is equal to. So to do that, I'm going to multiply by 2 to get rid of that. Okay, I'm multiplied by 2 over here. I'm going to divide by m because I'm solving for v. I divide by m. That's going to cancel right there. So I have 2gh equals v squared. I'm going to go ahead and square root v squared. I'll square root this side as well. So I'll end with square root of 2gh equals v. Okay, so I know my answer there is going to be c. Okay, so notice how I didn't have to go through and read any of this right here. Okay, if you, if you notice in your problem that you're given up here, or your equation, that there's a lot of variables, then oftentimes what you have to do is just solve for what one is equivalent to. So I always check my answer choices first to see if it's all what one variable equals because that's a, a pretty much a dead tell to me. And then the other thing I'm going to check is what ends, uh, what our ending question is here. And oftentimes I'll realize that I don't have to actually read this part. I just have to rearrange my equation, which in this case I had to rearrange it to solve for what V equals. So my answer for 10 there is going to be C. So I would put that strategy in my notes if I were you. All right, question 11. I've got a right triangle above. I've got x equals 60, so I'll go ahead and put that here, okay? I also know that I have a 90 degree angle here, which means I'm going to have a 30 here because my angles add to 180. So what is the length of side AB? So I'm going to solve for this. I'll call it y. Call that y. All right. Well, I see I have a 60, 30, 90 triangle. So now if you paid attention during our equations week where we took a first week and just went through the equations from the math section, we know with a 60, 30 triangle like this, that are across from our 30, we could call that an X, right? And then across from our 60, we would have X times root three, and then across 
from our, or our hypotenuse then is going to be that 2x, right? And I'll, I'm just going to quick run back. I think that you're given that equation as well. I'll just quick check. Either way, you're going to want to have it memorized, but I'll just quick check if you're given it as well, right? You see that it is right here, your special right triangles. So you're given that equation, but you really should have it memorized because it'll help you to save time. All right, so let's get back down here. We've got question 11. All right, well, if I know that my x is equal to 4, then I know my 2x is going to have to equal 2 times that 4, so that's going to have to equal 8. So that's going to tell me, then, that the length of side AB has to be 8. So notice how easy that was once we understood that 60-30 triangle rule, okay, that 60-30-90 triangle rule, that this is x, this is x times the cube root of 3, and then, or I'm sorry, times square root of 3, and then this right here is going to be 2 times x. We saw x was 4. 2 times 4 gives us 8. Okay, so understanding that 60, 30, 90 triangle rule there is very important. All right, so our answer for 11 there is going to be B. All right, question 12. Which of the following values is a solution to the equation above? All right, so one thing that I see immediately is that I see I have uh, what looks to be, I'm going to have to use my quadratic uh, formula, right, because I see that I have a number and a square root, and I have a number plus that over a number. So that's kind of telling me that I'm going to have to use my quadratic equation. Okay, so my quadratic equation is going to be negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That's my quadratic equation. All right, the other thing that I'm going to see is I just see that this doesn't factor, right? If you were to try to factor this, it won't work. So I know I'm going to have to use my quadratic equation to factor. So I'm going to have negative b. I know my b is 6. So I'm going to have negative 6 plus or minus the square root of b squared. So that's going to be 6 squared minus 4 times a, which is 4, times c, which is 1. And that's going to be all over 2 times a. I know that that's 2 times 4. All right, so now I just go through and I simplify. So negative 6 over 8, because 2 times 4 is 8. That's going to give me negative 3 over 4. Okay. And then I'm going to have this root 6 squared, so plus or minus root 6 squared. In this case, I see it has to be plus because all my answer choices have plus. So I'll just go ahead and do that here. It's going to be plus this uh, 6 squared is 36. 36 minus 4 times 4. That's going to be 36 minus 16. So that's going to give me root 20. Uh, and that root 20, that root 20 here, I'll go ahead and get rid of that. That's all over that 2 times 4, which is 8. So now what we're going to do is we're going to factor out this root 20 because we see none of our answer choices have a root 20 in it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a factor tree. We have a 2 times a 10. That gives us 20. A 2 times a 5 gives us 10. I see I can take my 2's out, and I could rewrite that as 2 times root 5. Okay, so 2 times root 5 is going to equal root 20. So I'm going to replace my root 20 here with 2 root 5. So I'll have plus 2 root 5. Well, now I see I can cancel this 2, make it a 1, cancel the 2 out of the 8, and make it a 4. Okay, so now I can just connect this here, take away my 1, because 1 times root 5 is the same as root 5, and I have negative 3 plus root 5 over 4. So my answer is going to be a for right there. So that right there is question 12, and we see our answer choice has to be A. So as far as things that you should have in your notes for this one, recognizing with answer choices that if we see that we have a number and then we have square roots right here, right, and we have a plus or a minus, especially if you see a plus or minus, so if this had a minus right there, so it was plus or minus there, or plus or minus here, then we're really, that's an indicator we're going to be using this quadratic formula here, okay? So that's really, really an indicator there. In this case, I still, even if it's a plus sign and no minus sign under it, I still see that it's going to be an indicator. I'm going to use this quadratic formula because I've got these roots, right? Normally, if it's factorable, we're not going to be dealing with roots like this, okay? And it won't be set up in this way. So that was a dead indicator to me that I had to use that quadratic formula. So I would put that in your notes. The next thing you should have in your notes is how to use a factor tree to simplify uh, square roots like this. So the square root of 20, I made a factor tree, right? 2 times 10 gave me 20, so I have a 2 here. 2 times 5 gave me 10. Since I have two twos here, and this is the square root, I can take them out and just have 2 times what's remaining here in this 5. Okay, so 2 root 5. So understanding factor trees is also important. All right, question 13. I've got c of t is equal to 50.25t plus 228.75. So I've got the average cost per square foot in dollars of a condominium in city x can be modeled by the function c defined above, where t is the number of years after 2001 and, zero is between, uh, and t is between 0 and 8. In the function, what does the number 50.25 represent? Well, I see that that's uh, right next to my t. Okay, so this is going to be dealing with my slope. Okay, since it's positive, I know I have an increasing cost. Okay, because as time increases, my cost will increase. 
And I know that it's not going to be, it won't be A, because A says the average cost per square foot in dollars of a condominium in 2001. No, it's not the average cost because we have to add in this 228 so we can get rid of A. B, the average cost per square foot in dollars of a condominium in 2009. No, we would have to plug in the the um, the 8 with the T there. Okay, so that 50.25 would have to get multiplied by that, that 8 since it's 8 years after 2001. And then we'd have to add 228 to get that. So B is incorrect. C, the approximation, uh, the approximate increase in years for each dollar. Increase in the average cost per square foot. No, it's not that approximate increase in years for each dollar increase. It is D, the approximate increase in the average cost per square foot in dollars of a condominium for each year after 2009. Because as T increases by one, our cost will increase by 50.25. All right, so as far as things that you could put in your notes for this one, really understand this right here, okay? This is really important to understand. When we're given an equation like this and we have a number or a coefficient with a variable, that is, that is going to be our slope. Okay, understanding that will be our slope and this over here will be our y-intercept. So our y-int or y-intercept. So really just understanding that and being able to apply that to the context of word problems like this, that can be really, really important. So being able to apply that slope and y-intercept to the context of word problems, and you'll get better at that with practice as you go on, but make sure that you really focus in on that with word problems. Focus on describing what they mean in the context of the problem. All right, question 14. What is the sum of the complex numbers 6 plus 5i plus 3 times i squared? Okay, one thing you need to know is that i squared equals negative 1. If you don't know that, put it in your notes. Since we know i squared equals negative 1, we can get rid of this and then multiply by negative 1, which means we'll have a minus 3. Okay, so we have plus 8 minus 3. Uh, that's just going to be 8 minus 3. It's going to become plus 5, okay, because we're asked for the sum of these numbers. So now we have 6 plus this 5, that gives us 11, and then we have to add this 5i here, add that 5i, and we see we're left with 11 plus 5, which is going to be, or I'm sorry, 11 plus 5i, which will be answer choice A. So as far as things you should put in your notes, this i squared equaling negative 1 is important to understand. Um, other than that, we were really just adding terms, okay? So understanding i squared equals negative 1. That's really the big thing with 14. 14 isn't really a word problem, so there's not a whole lot we have for tips there. All right, so which of the following could be the graph of y equals x squared plus 2x plus 2? All right, one thing I see immediately, the first thing I'm going to do when I see an equation like this, I'm asked to find the graph. The first thing that I'm thinking is factor it, okay? Now here I see I can't factor because I have a 2 here and a plus 2 here. If I was going to try and factor that, there's no factors of, of 2 that are going to add to be positive 2, okay? We could think about um, x times uh, negative 2 and then times an x times uh, negative 1, but then we're going to have negative 3x, so that's not going to give us positive. We could think about an x plus 2x times an x uh, plus 1, but then we have plus 3x, okay? So we see that that doesn't work as far as factoring. Okay, so we can't factor it, so I can't use that to find my zeros. And the other thing that indicates to me that I'm not going to be able to factor is the fact that these aren't labeled, right? We don't have numbers here. That's an indicator to me that this isn't going to be factorable, okay? Because otherwise, I could factor it and then plot where my 3 is, right? Because I know that has to be a 0. But the fact that my x-axis on my graph has no coordinates, that's telling me that factoring is probably not the way to go. Now, if it had coordinates, I'd immediately look to factor this. But in this case, it doesn't have coordinates. So I'm actually not going to look to immediately factor this. But I wanted to show you that just for other problems because a lot of times they will have coordinates and factoring is going to be your best option. But if you see that there are no coordinates, then don't necessarily waste time factoring. See if you can solve it another way. So one thing I see immediately is I see my lowest, or I'm sorry, my lowest or my y-intercept is going to be positive 2. So I'm going to check and make sure they all have a y-intercept of positive 2. I see that they do. So I can't get rid of anything based on that. But the other thing that I see is that when I go to the right from 2, right? So as I increase x going to the right from 2, this will go up. This plus 2x means I'm going to add 2 times a number that's positive. So that's going to go up. And this 2 will be constant. So I'm going to have to go up, right, as I go to the right from 2. So that means A and B are possible answer choices, but C and D are not because they go down from to the, as we go to the right of 2, or of 0, right, 2 being our y-intercept here. Okay, so I know C and D can't be correct. Okay, so now the other big difference that I'm looking at is will we ever be negative? Okay, so will we ever cross into negative territory? So here's what I'm going to do to determine that. I see I have a plus 2 here. I see I only have a plus 2x here, right? And if I'm going to go negative, right, Eventually, this x squared, a negative number squared, will be the same as the positive number squared. 
So that squaring is going to be worth more than whatever this uh, two times the negative number is going to be worth. So I'm really just looking at a couple points here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in negative one. And what I'm going to see is I'll see if I was going to use negative one as x, I'll have minus two x, right? Minus two times one, which is just minus two. That's going to be countered by my plus two. And then I'll have a plus one from negative one squared. So that's just going to give me one, right? And then if I was going to look and move on to a uh, negative two, well, negative two times two is going to give me negative four. Negative four plus two is going to give me a negative two. And then I have to take that negative two and I have to add negative two squared to it, which is positive four. And I see I'm going to get positive two. Okay. And then I'm going to get positive two. Okay. So that's what that answer right there would be positive two. So now I see I'm just back here. Okay. So there's really no way I'm ever going to cross below zero. So I know A has to be incorrect and I know B has to be my correct answer for 15. Okay. So when you can't factor, which an indicator you can't factor is that there's not going to be coordinates here. Okay. So that's going to tell you you're probably not going to be able to factor. First thing that I'm going to do is look at the Y intercept, see if I can use that to get rid of some answer choices. Next thing I'm going to look to do, uh, is it opening up like this or is it opening down like this? In this case, they all opened up, so I couldn't do anything with that. Third thing that I was going to do is I was going to look from my Y intercept, do as I go right, am I going up or down? Okay. That was able to get rid of two of my answer choices. So as X goes to the right, uh, what does Y do? So what does Y do there? So that helped me get rid of C and D. The next thing that I did is I looked at my zeros, right? So zeros meaning my X intercepts. So in this case, I wasn't looking at my X intercepts with coordinates. I was just looking to see if we crossed the X axis. Okay. So in this case, it was just an X axis, okay, X axis. So do we ever cross it? All right. So that takes us through our tips for question 15. Now we're going to go ahead and switch over to the math with calculator section problems 9 through 15. Keep in mind that they're going to be easier because they are earlier on in the math section for the math with calculator. So let's go ahead and make that transition over to section 4. All right, we've got question nine is right here. I'm gonna grab my calculator real quick in case I need it. All right, let's get started with this. So we've got, let me get there real quick. All right, we've got on November 1st, there were 2,500 boxes in a warehouse. On December 1st, there were 15% fewer boxes in the warehouse than there were on November 1st. Okay, so I'm gonna have 2,500. Multiply it by 0 0.85. On January 1st, there were 20% more boxes in the warehouse than there were on December 1st. Okay, so there were 20% more than there were on December 1st. How many boxes were in the warehouse on January 1st? All right, well, this is going to be my answer right here. It's going to be this 2,500 times 0.85. So how did I get 0.85 is probably what you're wondering. Well, I saw on December 1st, there were 15% fewer than there were on November 1st. So I started with this 2,500 boxes on November 1. Then I lost 15% of them. So I had to multiply by that 100% minus 15%, which is 85%, which is going to be that 0 0.85. Then I had to multiply by 1.2 because we got 20% more than there were on December 1st. Okay, so this is what we're going to have on December 1st. We have to multiply that by that 1.2 since we have 20% more than there were on December 1st by January 1st. So as far as how many boxes there were in the warehouse on January 1st, that is going to be, let's go ahead and plug it into the calculator real quick. We see we have 2,550. So our answer there is going to be C for number nine. So this one right here is one where I would recommend using a calculator just because it's pretty simple, pretty quick. Uh, I don't recommend using a calculator for every single question, but this one right here is one where I would certainly recommend using it. So that's just one thing to note. You don't have to put it in your notes or anything, but just a friendly tip there. Um, as far as things that I would put in your notes for this question, there's really not a whole lot. The only thing that I would put in if you don't have it yet is just recognizing how I, I went ahead and I wrote this equation as I read through. I paused for a minute, but that was just more because I kind of misread something. But understanding that as we read through word problems on the math section, it's really important to just be writing down the equation as we read it because then we don't have to go back and reread. And if we have to reread things on the SAT math section, we're wasting time, especially in these early questions when we want to be quick so we can have time for the harder ones. So understanding that, and that's a strategy you can put in your notes if you would like. Okay, right here. 
boom, immediately what I'm seeing is I'm seeing an inequality and I see I have a lot of words. Okay, that's telling me I want to write my inequality as I read through. So we have Jonathan needs to earn at least $175 next week. Okay, it was at least, so it has to be uh, whatever, or I'm sorry, he wants to earn at least $175. Okay, so whatever he earns has to be more than that, or at least that. So $175 next week and he can work at most 20 hours. Okay, so he has to work at most 20 hours, so he wants to work less than or equal to 20 hours. He earns $10 per hour at his lawn service job, so he earns $10 times however many hours he works lawn. Okay, another thing you should put in your notes is that when you read through these questions, the SAT does a really good job of going ahead and just making the labels really simple. Like we see lawn service job is L, okay? So you can anticipate that as you read through. Like I saw a lawn service job, I didn't even see this part yet, but I already knew it was gonna be L because that's how they work. They give you very, very simple uh, letters. So understand that. All right, and he earns $8 per hour as job at the gym. So that's gonna be plus eight G, right? And I'll use a lowercase g. Which of the following systems of inequalities represents, uh, oh, and that 20 has to be less than L plus G, right? So we have G, L plus G, because he has to work less than 20 hours in total between the two. Which of the following systems of inequalities represents the situation in terms of the number of hours he will work at his lawn service L, number of hours he will work at his gym G next week? All right, let me just find which equation matches this and we're good. So let's go ahead and see which one we got. Uh, answer choice A is incorrect because it's showing that 10L plus 8G is less than 175. Uh, same with answer choice B. Now I look at answer choice C. Answer choice C is the only one that has that. So my answer there is going to be C for number nine. Okay, so that's really the big tip here is going ahead and writing down your equation as you read through so you don't have to waste time reading it twice. Okay, and then once you have these equations down, you can just go ahead. All right, my screen timed out there, so we're going to have to start at number 11 here. I pretty much was done explaining 10 anyways, so let's go ahead and get into 11. So we've got the future value of an investment after 20 years for different interest rates. So we have an initial investment of $1,000 is made at a constant annual interest rate. The graph above shows the corresponding future value V in dollars of the investment for different annual interest rates R after 20 years. One graph shows the value when the interest is compounded daily. The other graph shows when the value is compounded annually, which of the following statements is true. Okay, only way to do this is to read the statements. That's it. Uh, there's really no tips here. We just go down A through D till we find one that's true. All right, as R increases at a constant rate, V increases more rapidly if interest is compounded annually than daily. Okay, I know this is wrong, and you can look at the graph, but one thing you should know is if, comp if interest is compounded daily, right, or continuously versus annually, then uh, we're going to increase in value faster. Okay, so that's something you should just know from our equations um, or just in general. So you should put that in your notes if you don't know that yet. And we see that in our, in our table here or our graph we see that compounded daily is going to be larger than R compounded annually. So we see that in the graph as well. So we know that that's false. And then we have B, as R increases at a constant rate, V increases more rapidly if interest is compounded daily than annually. Yes, that is going to be true. So our answer there is going to be B. Okay, and we see that that is supported by our graph with compounded daily increasing at a faster rate than that compounded annually. All right, so question 11 is going to be answer choice B. As far as tips for that, Really, we need to understand if we're asked for what statement is true, we have no choice but to go up down A through D. There's no way around that. We have to read all of them, okay? So that's really just about it for that one. Uh, and then I already talked about the difference between compounded annually and compounded continuously. So, all right, we've got questions 12 through 14. They're referring to the following information. So for gym class, Shayla completed a four-mile walking and running exercise. She ran for 17 miles and she walked for three times uh, the quantity 13 over 15 minus T miles, where T is the total amount of time an hour Shayla spent running. The equation 7T plus 3 times 13 over 15 minus T equals 4 models the situation. What's the best interpretation of the value of 7 in the equation that models this situation? All right, well, the value of 7 here, it gets multiplied by T, which is the total amount of time. And we're told that she runs for 7 times T miles. Okay, so if she's running for that many miles, then the 7 has to be how many miles she's running per hour, right? That's her speed, okay? And we know she's running, not walking, so A has to be incorrect. Okay, so our answer there has to be B. She's not walking or running for seven minutes. She's running however many miles, seven times the amount of time that she runs is equal to, right? That time will cancel and we'll be left with units in miles. So units, using units to cancel, once again here, that is a way to get to the correct answer choice or to check your work, whatever you would like there. So that's a tip you can have as well. I've talked about that pretty extensively before, so you probably have that in your notes already. All right, what is the value of t in the equation that models the situation? So now we're just asked to solve. Okay, so to solve, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take this 3, multiply it by that minus t. So I have 7t minus 3t. That'll leave us with 4t. 
Okay, and then I'm going to have to take this 3 and multiply it by 13 over 15. That's going to give me 3 times 13, which is 39 over 15. That's going to give me 2.6. Okay, so now I'm going to do this 4 minus 2.6. That's going to give me 1.4. I divide each side by 4 now. 1.4 over 4. And that's going to give me a 0 0.35. Okay, I have to convert that to a fraction is what I see here. And that's going to be 7 over 20 as a fraction. All right, one thing that you can also use as far as a tip is try to use the denominator to figure out what your last term has to be. In this case, since my denominator is 20, my last term's got to be either a 5 or a 0. So that kind of told me that since my last term here was a 5, that having an odd number, right, that tells me an odd number divided by 20, it has to end in a 5, right? So I saw this ended in a 5. Immediately, I'm looking at this one. My answer there is going to be B. All right, that takes me through 13. Uh, the tips I said, I already set them, so I'm not really got anything more there. Now I've got question 14. All right, question 14. What was the total distance Shayla spent running and walking in kilometers? Okay, we're just taking our total distance, which was 4, right? We saw that it equaled 4 miles. We just take our 4 miles, and we're going to cancel units by multiplying by uh, 1.61 kilometers per 1 mile, okay? So here we just multiply that 4 by 1.61 in our calculator, or you can do it in your head. It's going to give you just about 6.44. So our answer there is going to be C for number 14. We see that our miles cancel, right? So canceling units, once again, pretty prominent. I suggest using it to make sure you get to the correct answer. And yeah, I've talked about that before. Just said it again. You see how, rep how if you really understand these patterns, how it can really help you with the SAT math section. And that's really what I'm trying to help you do is see these tricks and these patterns you can use. So you see that they're repetitive and that's good because you want to be uh, very, very proficient and be have, have these tricks memorized is really important. 15, which of the following is a graph with no solution? Uh, that's going to be answer choice A, right? How did I recognize that so, so fast? Because an answer choice has no solution or a graph has no solution if their equations never intersect or their lines don't intersect. They don't intersect in A, but they intersect in all other problems, right? This right here in C, this means that they have uh, all the same solutions, right? They contain all real solutions, or all solutions are together. All right, and then D, we have uh, intercepts as well. We have intercepts in B, right? We have millions and millions of intercepts in C, right? A is the only one with no solution there. All right, so let's go ahead and switch over to the SAT reading section for today. All right, let's switch over to the reading section now. So now we're going to spend about 25 minutes with the reading section. We're going to go through one passage. And as I go through, I'll really be trying to teach you how to identify question types today, as well as how to use that identification of a question type in order to help you find wrong answer choices and get to the right answer choice faster. So it's really going to be focusing in on identifying question types and identifying the strategies we can use with each question type in order to be successful on the SAT reading section. So we're really going to be focusing on how can we become more efficient in finding the correct answer on the SAT reading section. So I'll be giving you tips to put in your notes as I go through this passage. So we're only going to do one passage today and we're going to go very, very slow just so that I can give you more tips and insights into the SAT reading section. In the following weeks, we'll start getting into more of how we can pace to get faster on the SAT reading section. But for now, I just want to focus on teaching you how to be accurate with the SAT reading section. So let's go ahead and get started. This is from SAT practice test three. We're going to do passage uh, one, so the questions one through 10. So let's go ahead and get started. So anything that I highlight is things that I would underline as I read through it. So I'm just going to do a basic read through, uh, similar to how I would do it on the SAT reading section, but just a little bit slowed down. All right, so this passage is from Seiki, the Schartz Metterklume method, originally published in 1911. Lady Carlota stepped out onto the platform of the small wayside station and took a turn or two up and down its uninteresting length to kill time till the train should be pleased to proceed on its way. Then in the roadway beyond, she saw a horse struggling with more than ample load and a carter of the sort that seems to be a bear, a sullen hatred against the animal that helps him to earn a living. Lady Carlota promptly betook her to the roadway and put a rather different complexion on the struggle. Certain of her acquaintances were won't to give her plentiful admi admonition as to the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a distressed animal, such interference being none of her business. Only once has she put the doctrine of non-interference into practice, when one of its most elegant exponents had been besieged for nearly three hours in a small and extremely uncomfortable may tree by an angry boar, while Lady Carlota on the other side of the fence had proceeded with the watercolor sketch she was engaged on and refused to interfere between the boar and its prisoner. 
it is to be feared that she lost the friendship of the untimely rescued lady. On this occasion, she merely lost the train, which gave way to the first sign of impatience it had shown throughout the journey, and steamed off without her. She bore the desertion with, with philosophical indifference. Her friends and relatives were thoroughly well used to the fact that her luggage would arrive without her. She wired a vague, non-committal message to her destination, saying she was coming by another train. Before she had time to think about what her next move might be, she was confronted by an imposingly attired lady who seemed to be taking a prolonged mental inventory of her clothes and looks. You must be Miss Hope, the governess I've come to meet, said the apparition, in a tone that admitted of, that admitted of very little argument. Very well, if I must, I must, said Lady Carlota to herself with a dangerous meekness. I am Mrs. Quaborough, continued the lady, and where, pray, is your luggage? It's gone astray, said the alleged governor and governess, falling in with the excellent rule of life that the absent are always to, be to blame. The luggage had, in point of fact, behaved with, correct, with perfect correctitude. I've just telegraphed about it, she added, with a near approach to truth. How provoking, said Mrs. Quaborough. These railways companies are so careless. However, my maid can lend you things for the night, and she led the way to her car. During the drive to the Quabro mansion, Lady Carlotta was impressively introduced to the nature of the charge that had been thrust upon her. She learned that Claude, Wilfred were delicate, sensitive young people, that Irene had the artistic temperament highly developed, and that Viola was something or other else of a mold equally commonplace among children of that class and type in the 20th century. I wish them not only to be taught, said Mrs. Quarrel, but interested in what they learn. In history lessons, for instance, you must try to make them feel as though they are being introduced to the real-life stories of men and women who really lived, not merely committing a mass of names and dates to memory. French, of course, I shall expect you to talk at mealtimes during several days a week. I shall talk French four days of the week and Russian in the remaining three. Russian, my dear Miss Hope, no one in the house speaks or understands Russian. That will not embarrass me in the least, said Lady Car Carlota coldly. Mrs. Corborough, to use a colloquial expression, was knocked off her perch. She was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals who are magnificent and autocratic as long as they are not seriously opposed. The least show of unexpected resistance goes a long way towards rendering them coed and apologetic. When the new governess failed to express wandering admiration of the large, newly purchased and expensive car and lightly alluded to the superior advantages of one or two makes, which had been just put on the market, the discomfiture of her patroness became almost abject. Her feelings were those which might have animated a general of ancient warfaring days. On beholding his heaviest battle elephant ignominiously driven off the field by slingers and javelin throwers. All right, now we can go ahead and we'll get into the questions in a minute. I want to tell you why I highlighted these things. Keep in mind, I highlighted them just because it's easier as I read through since I'm not using a paper and a pencil, but on the SAT, you'll have to underline instead of highlight. So let's just go over why I highlighted these things. All right, so the first thing I did is I highlighted this why right here. So I like to highlight or underline things that are why, where, when, um, sometimes how as well, but how is a bit more rare because that can just be explanation at times. So I, I like to underline those things. I also like to underline claims. Uh, I don't underline evidence because that's going to take up too much, right? At that point, I would be underlining most of the text and I don't want to do that. So here was a why, right? She started taking the stroll to kill time until the train should proceed on its way. So while she's waiting for the train, she's killing time and walking around. The next thing that I saw that I thought was important was, uh, her be taking to the roadway, right? Certain of her acquaintances won't, won't give her plentiful admi admonition as the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a distressed animal, such interference being none of her business. Okay, so right here, we're really talking about her doing things that are none of her business, okay? So I highlighted that because that's kind of a uh, important thing as far as her character goes. So character development in the literature section, okay? And this is particular to the literature passage, but for the literature passage, I also underline character development at times. So things that give me insight into who the character is as a person. So I'll underline character development as well. So that's specific to the literature passage though, which is usually questions one through 10 is the literature passage. So I'll underline character development there, but I won't do that in the other passages because there really isn't much. All right. Only once had she put the doctrine of non-interference into practice. Okay, I highlighted this because of this word here, only once. So anything like only once or in contrast, anything that contrasts what was previously said, I always want to highlight or underline that because that's an exception and that exception can be important. So I always want to pay attention to that. All right. 
Next thing I underlined, it is to be feared that she lost the friendship of the untimely rescued lady. Now keep in mind, I underlined this without knowing what the rest of this passage is going to be. Okay, so I don't know whether or not this untimely or this ultimately rescued lady is important or not, but it's her introduction. And since it's the introduction of a new character, I wanted to underline it just in case it was going to be important. Okay, it turned out not to be important in this case, but sometimes it will be important. All right, next thing we had was she bore the desertion with philosophical indifference. Okay. All right, so her boring the desertion with philosophical indifference is giving me more insight into her character because she does not care, right? She does not care that uh, she missed the train, right? So this is giving me insight into her character that she doesn't care if she misses a train as long as she feels like she did the right thing by helping out the animal. So that's character insight. So I wanted to underline that one as well. Uh, next thing was that it was well, uh, her friends and relatives were well used to the fact of her luggage arriving without her. Okay, so I highlighted that because her luggage arriving without her tells us that this is a pattern of behavior where she isn't on time and she skips things to go do other things. Okay, the next thing that I highlighted or underlined would be this, you must be Miss Hope. Okay, the governess I've come to meet. Okay, I underlined that because she is not Miss Hope, she is Lady Carlota. Okay, but then she says, very well, if I must, I must. So she's pretending to be Miss Hope. So that's really important to the passage as we move forward. So that's why I highlighted it because we now have, she's impersonating this Miss Hope character. So that's really important to uh, character development and to the development of the passage and the development of the plot. So for the literature section, uh, things that are development to the plot as well. So developing the plot, I would underline those as well. All right, I am Mrs. Quaborough, continued the lady, and where, pray, is your luggage? It's gone astray, said the alleged governess, falling in with the excellent rule of life that the absent are always to blame. The luggage had, in point of fact, behaved with perfect correctitude. I've just telegraphed about it, she added with a nearer approach to the truth. Okay, this right here, a nearer approach to the truth that tells me she's lying, which I already know. But once again, if there's uh, any question that would ask for something about her lying, I see that it would be there. So that's why I underlined it. All right, last thing that I underlined on this page right here was talking about who these children are, right, that she's going to nanny for or tutor. That's going to be Irene, Viola, Claude, Wilfred. So any question that asks me uh, specifically about those characters, if there is one, I have where that is as well. So that's character development. That's why I underlined it. All right, then I have uh, mold, right? The children are something else of a mold equally commonplace among children of that class and type in the 20th century. So these children are typical of the other children who are uh, in this class and type in the 20th century. So I thought that was important for character development as well. Okay, and then down here, she was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals who are magnificent and autocratic as long as they are not seriously opposed. Once again, that's character development. So if you're seeing a pattern here in the literature section, I'm focusing a fair amount on character development when I'm reading through and underlining things. Okay, so that's something I would recommend for the, the literature section, but only for the literature section. Keep in mind, this is particular to that literature section. So today is really going to be a lot about focusing on how to approach that literature section. So there's a lot of character development that's important here. Okay, so character development is really important in the literature section, but it's very, very much not important in the science section. So understand that. Okay, and it's only moderately, if that, on the history social science section. Really, it's not that important on that either. Okay, so that takes us through everything that I have underlined and why. So now we can go ahead and get into the questions, what types they are, and how to approach them. All right, so question one, we have which choice best summarizes the, the passage. That is going to be a big picture question, so we want to look at the passage as a whole. All right, this is a big picture question. All right, so if we're going to think about the passage as a whole, what we have to consider is a summary in this case. Sometimes it'll be a central idea, but in this case, it's a summary. So what happens here? Well, we have a woman who does not correct a stranger who mistakes her for someone else. Okay, that's what occurs here. We have a woman who is uh, Mrs. or let's see what her name is. I forgot her name. Uh, Lady Carlota. Okay, Lady Carlota is mistaken for the nanny right, by Mrs. Uh, Quaborough, and Mrs. Quaborough continues on thinking that Lady Carlota is the nanny when in fact she is not, so she's not correcting the stranger when she mistakes her for the nanny, okay, so that's what occurs here, that's summarizing the passage. We have A, a woman weighs the positive and negative aspects of accepting a new job. No, she just takes the job that's not even hers without considering positive and negative consequences or aspects. C, a woman impersonates someone else to seek revenge on an acquaintance. She's not seeking revenge on anyone, so C is incorrect. D, a woman takes an immediate dislike to her new employer. It doesn't say she dislikes her, okay? 
So that's going to be wrong as well. In line two, turn most nearly means. Well, we have to go to line two then and come up with our own answer first so we're not swayed by answer choices. So we have Lady Carlota stepped out onto the platform of the small wayside station and took a turn or two up and down its uninteresting length to kill time. Okay, in this case, we're really talking about her pacing up and down, right, this train station. So her taking a short walk would be an example or a leisurely stroll, right? So either of those answer choices is really what I'm looking for. I see that I have a short walk, okay? This isn't a slight movement or a change in rotation or a course correction. We're talking about her taking a short walk. So that's gonna be C for number two. All right, number three, the passage most clearly implies that other people regard Lady Carlota as what? Well, that's gonna be A, outspoken, okay? And here's gonna be our evidence for that. If we were to go back up, we know that right here, right? And this is one of the things that I highlighted. Certain of her acquaintances were wont to give her plentiful admonition as to the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a stressed animal. Okay, so she's outspoken. She's interfering on behalf of other people's business. And such interference was none of her business, right? So they're really saying she butts into things that are none of her business. She's really outspoken in that way. So our evidence there is going to be 10 to 14. So that's going to be answer choice A. So I'm now at this point, I'll go ahead and go through why the other answers in three were wrong. Okay, we have tactful. Okay, she isn't a tactician. She's not tactful. Ambitious. Uh, this one, you can't really draw that she's ambitious just from her not, uh, oh, of how other people regard Lady Carlota. Yeah, it never says that other people regard her as ambitious, right? You may regard her as ambitious, but it never says other people in the text do. So that's why C is wrong. It never says other people regard her as unfriendly either, just that she's outspoken, right? She goes out of her way and takes things that aren't her business, which in a way is kind of friendly. So D is incorrect in that sense as well. All right, and then we already got four. Question five, okay, the description of Lady Carlota put the doctrine of non-interference into practice, lines 14 through 15. This mainly serves to do what? All right, well, let's go ahead and let's go back to what really happens there. So lines 14 to 15, putting the doctrine, okay, only once had she put the doctrine of non-interference into practice when one of its most eloquent exponents had been besieged for nearly three hours in a small, extremely uncomfortable May tree by an angry boar. While Lady Carlota on the other side of the fence had proceeded with the watercolor sketch she was engaged on and refused to interfere between the boar and its prisoner. And it's feared she lost the friendship of the untimely or the ultimately rescued lady. Okay, so what are we really talking about here? All right, well, that, what that really is showing us, right, is that it's insight into our character. Okay, how is it insight into our character? Well, we're giving an example of a time when she breaks that cycle that we talked about before, that cycle of being outspoken, right? We're talking about an exception to that where she practiced non-interference. So before that, we were talking about how she's really interfering a lot. Okay, now we're talking about how she didn't interfere on this one occasion, okay? So we're not foreshadowing her capacity for deception because she never deceives. So A is incorrect. B, illustrating the subtle cruelty in her nature, never describes her as cruel. Okay, so we can get rid of B. D, explaining a surprising change in her behavior. Well, there is a change in her behavior, right? It's not really a surprising change because it only occurs once, right? So that's going to be wrong as well. Okay, putting this practice of non-doctrine into practice, all that it's really doing is providing a humorous insight into the character, okay? It's showing us that she went and she didn't help in this one situation, which provides insight into the fact that she isn't always going to be outspoken, okay? There are other occasions, okay? And the way that it was set up was uh, with humor. I believe the story was with a pig, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I believe it was with a pig and a fence. So yeah, an angry boar pig, right? On one side of the fence, a watercolor sketch she was engaged on, right? So that one's really humorous as well. So that is also correct. So C is gonna be the answer to number five. So question six in line 55, charge most nearly means what? Well, let's go there and come up with our own answer choice first. So we have in line 55, charge most nearly means what? Carlota was impressively introduced to the nature of the charge that had been enthrust upon her. Okay, in this case, charge is going to mean occupation, job, role, or responsibilities, right? Occupation, job, role, or responsibilities would all be good answer choices there. So I'm going to see if I have anything along those lines. Okay, I see I have responsibility, which was one of my answer choices that I came up with. That's going to be my correct answer. We aren't talking about a fee or an expense or an attack. All right, question seven. 
And just so you know, question six, any question that has an inline 55 charge most nearly means or anything like that, that's a most nearly means question, that's a words in context question. Words in context question. So that's really just making sure you're able to understand the meaning of words based on the context that it's placed in. So any questions you see like that, those are words in context questions. So that's the question type there. All right, question seven. The narrator indicates that Claude, Wilfred, Irene, and Viola are what? Well, that's going to be similar to many of their peers. And I'll go ahead and show you my evidence for that. I'm assuming my next question's evidence. It's possible it isn't. Uh, it is not. Okay, but either way, we still want to support it with evidence. So let's go ahead and find that, right? If I was to go back, you see that I highlighted or underlined right here, uh, a mold equally commonplace among children of that class and type in the 20th century. So that's showing that these children aren't necessarily that unique. They're similar to others in that class uh, in the 19th century. So that's going to be answer choice A. We don't say they're unusually creative and intelligent or hostile to the idea of a governess or more educated than others of their age. All right, now we've got question. Uh, so question seven, as far as what that is, that's really just testing your uh, ability to go back and understand the text. So really that one's kind of a reading comprehension question more than anything else, is making sure you can recall that it said that they are uh, similar to their peers. So that's really just a reading comprehension question there about a specific part of the passage. Question eight, the narrator implies that Mrs. Quabrough favors a form of education that emphasizes what? Well, that's going to be answer choice B, active engagement, okay? Now, how do we know this? Well, we know this, and I'll go ahead and show you the evidence that I would use for it if I were asked to have evidence, but we should always have evidence anyways. We see that she says, I wish them not only to be taught, but interested in what they learn. She wants them to be introduced to real life men and women. Uh, she wants them to not just commit things to memory, but to understand them. She wants them to practice French. So that's really active learning there, All right? Actively engaged in history and other subjects. Uh, she doesn't talk about artistic experimentation. Factual retention, she actually argues against that. And then traditional values, she's less concerned with that, more concerned with them being actively engaged. All right, question nine, as presented, or as far as the question type for question eight, the narrator implies Ms. Carble favors a form of education that emphasizes what? This one, it's really just reading comprehension and making sure that you're going back to the text to support your answer, right? You don't have to provide evidence here, but it's really testing two things, right? Either A, that you can comprehend it your first time reading and recall it, okay, so that's A or B, that you're willing to go back to the text and find that answer. But either way, it's really just testing you on your comprehension of the text and ability to interpret the text. All right, question nine. As presented in the passage, Mrs. Quarborough is best described as what? Well, that's going to be answer choice B. She's outwardly imposing, but she's easily defied, right? And how do we have evidence for that? Well, our evidence for that is going to be where we talk about how uh, on the outside she's imposing, but if you were to kind of counter her with anything, she would easily become apologetic, right? And I actually see I have apologetic right here. So that's great because then I know I can go and look at these lines first to see if that would be my best evidence. So that's what I'm going to do. It was line 77 to 82. I see I have, she was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals. Okay, that supports my first part. Who are magnificent and autocratic as long as they are not seriously opposed. The least show of unexpected resistance goes a long way towards rendering them cowed and apologetic. Okay, that's showing any resistance and they will pretty much submit. So they're easily defied, but at first they're outwardly imposing. So that supports both of these. Okay, keep in mind your evidence has to support this and this. Okay, and answer choice D is the only one that does both of those. So 10 is going to have to be D. Okay, any question like this where it's asked for the best evidence, that one is basically, I would just call it an evidence question, right? You just have to be able to support your answer. So that's really just uh, being able to provide evidence. Question nine, as presented in the passage, Ms. Quarbo is best described as that one is right there. The literature section is kind of unique with the SAT reading section uh, in, all, in all honesty. There's some questions that you kind of only will see on the literature section, and these kind of are, are what they are, right? Things like Ms. Quarbo is best described as, questions that are specific to characters. You don't really see that so much in any other passage on the SAT reading section. So the literature section is fairly unique in that sense right? So really these ones are ability to uh, interpret how characters are developed, right? And what characters different traits are is what question nine is really about. So as far as A, C, and D for question nine and why they're wrong, uh, superficially kind, but actually selfish. We never really see that she's necessarily superficially kind or that she's actually selfish. So we can get rid of A. That's really kind of a stretch. And we'd have to make a value judgment that couldn't be supported by the text. So you can get rid of A just by knowing you can't support it. Can't support all right, B, 
socially successful but irrationally bitter. We never see that she's irrationally bitter, so C is incorrect. Naturally generous but frequently imprudent. Uh, we never see that she's frequently imprudent, so D is going to be wrong as well. All right, so that takes us through our reading section today and what I really wanted to cover. So today was really about teaching you the difference between the literature section and the science section. So kind of teaching you what's particular to the literature section, how it's different, what I look for, um, things like that. I talked about some question types as well. We talked about words and context questions. Um, so that's kind of your recap. We talked about how I underline different things for the literature section than I do for the science and the social studies slash history sections. Okay, for the literature sections, I focus on character development. Uh, I still focus on who, what, why, when, and where. Um, I focus on the development of the plot, but we have to pay attention to character development in the literature section, and we don't really have to do that on the other sections. So that was one big, big difference between all of those sections. All right, so that's going to take us through the reading section today. As always, if my videos are helpful to you, there will be a donation link in the description when it's up and running. Any private SAT tutoring I'm doing will be linked in the description as well. Uh, any college admissions consulting as far as essays go and things like that will be linked in the description if I'm doing that. And make sure to like, subscribe, and share. And thanks for watching, and have a great day.